I got a question for you, General. In the event of a revolution, do you think the military would turn on the U.S. people? That's been asked me a number of times. My answer to that would be the hierarchy of the government would not stand by the Constitution necessarily, but would stand by the political chain of command. We know the Marines and the Special Operations Forces for sure will stand by the American people. Whether the file and the ranks of all the services would stand by the Constitution and the people is a big question. But I think what's going on, our military is awakening. They see these rules of engagement and the misdiagnosis of the enemy. The lack of proper strategy and tactics to win and come back home is there. The troops know that. And I learned that at West Point, that troops always know. The leaders sometimes don't know. We've already had an attempted coup. When Ambassador Stevens was murdered, General Ham, at the time he was the head of AFRICOM, was launching a rescue mission with commando troops. And Admiral Gayette, who was the commander of Carrier Task Force 3 in the area, he was providing surveillance. He was providing air cover and intelligence. Both men were arrested by their number two. I don't know about the number two behind Gayette, but I was able to find out about the number two behind Ham. His name was Colonel Rodriguez. He was a member of the CIA. He stepped in and stopped this attempt. Now, the overall plan did not end there. And I want to talk about the significance of this. You've got the head of AFRICOM, and you've got the head of Carrier Task Force 3. You've got two of the top four military commanders in the region. And if you recall your history at that time, we were on the verge of taking on Syria and Iran. No pretenses. We were making noise. We were making provoking moves, trying to get the other side to punch us in the nose first so we could go in. So this was considered to be a war zone, and you had two of the top four military commanders conspiring to disobey a direct presidential directive to not intervene in Benghazi. Had Ambassador Stevens been rescued, and the plot was able to be revealed for all to see, the Watergate of all time, if you will, that would have been the toppling of the Obama administration. Hence, a bloodless military coup that would have been carried out through legal impeachment and probably imprisonment of this president. With 264, and that's my latest count, of senior command military officers fired by the Obama administration, isn't it interesting that not one of them is going on Fox? Not one of them is writing a book. Not one of them is trying to cash in on their fame and fortune as a general and trying to basically make political hay against this president. They're strangely quiet because they're joining a movement. But before a coup can be initiated, Obama is going to initiate his own false flag, and then the games are going to begin. Last May, Treasury Secretary Jack Lew came out and said, we're going to take some federal retirement accounts for protective purposes, take the money for safekeeping, and eventually we'll just give it back. Move forward into last year, we got confirmation that MF Global will never be punished in terms of what John Corzine did because that follows that principle of 90% of the law is your own possession of that money. The principle has been set. With a stroke of a pen, we seen almost 18% of the economy under the Affordable Care Act transitioning into control by the government, control of small business functioning, control of who your doctor is, control of all prices related to health care. Myra coming on the heels of the Affordable Care Act will follow the same pattern. And what we're going to see is there's going to be a crisis. And then there's going to be the rollout of mandatory Myra. And the governments who are broke are going to take more and more of our money. Effectively, we are going to become slave labor, where everything we earn is subject to confiscation from the government. The stock market compared now to 1928 and 1929, there's not a lot of difference. And if there's a stock market crash and the government starts grabbing funds, that explains the 2.2 billion rounds of DHS acquired ammunition to go with their 2,700 armored personnel carriers to the Russians that are training in the streets of America, training in specialized camps. And this is also why I've talked to two of the fire generals. And what they have told me, some of these generals are actually talking about initiating a guerrilla resistance that will end up being a civil war in this scenario that we're talking about. So I do think we're going to see bloodshed in the streets. I think we're going to see DHS and the Russians and what other blue helmets are in this country against the American military, the veterans, in a guerrilla warfare, along with whatever civilians will join them. 
and I think it's going to be literal hell on earth. This is a criminal mafia organization that's trying to run the planet, and people that no longer fill the purpose or key witnesses who might speak out are disappearing. When I first heard about the first few bankers, I thought this was the canary in the mind that the system was about to collapse, and these people were killing themselves like the 1929 stockbrokers did when they jumped out of the Wall Street buildings. But now it's pretty clear this is an orchestrated effort to wipe these people out for a specific reason. Somewhere between about 450 and 500 top-level bankers have left the United States. The bankers don't want to be in the countries where there's going to be turmoil. So they're going to less invasive places, places of safety and solitude. The other bankers that we're seeing die now are bankers that if this thing rolls up badly and we see court actions, if the people win, who could testify against me? This is why these bankers are being eliminated. This is evidence tampering through murder. Why are they killing the bankers if it's about evidence tampering to keep them from talking? Is there a counteraction that's coming? Are they worried about losing a civil war? Are they worried that someday there's going to be a Nuremberg trial for bankers? If we're not one of their bankster employees carry out their acts of heinous enslavement of this country, we are all felons. You have the Biac report, you have the Connecticut actions. We are all terrorists. You're either with the Constitution or you're with the enslavers. And that's really what this comes down to. Mr. Estevez, in the NPR investigation of the 1033 program, they list that 12,000 bayonets have been given out. What purpose are bayonets being given out for? Senator, bayonets are available under the program. I can't answer what a local police force would need a bayonet I can give you an answer, none. So what's President Obama's administration's position on handing out bayonets to the police force? It's on your list. You guys create the list. You're going to take it off the list. We're going to keep doing it. We are going to look at what we are providing under the administration's review of all these programs. So it's unclear at this point whether President Obama approves of 12,000 bayonets being given out. I would think you can make that decision last week. I think we need to review all the equipment that we're providing, Senator. And as I said, we, the Department of Defense, do not push any of this equipment on any police force. The states decide what they need. My understanding is that you have the ability to decide what equipment is given out and what equipment is not given out. If you decided tomorrow, if President Obama decided tomorrow that mine-resistant ambush protection 20-ton vehicles are not appropriate for cities in the United States. He could decide tomorrow to take it off the list. You could decide this tomorrow. My question is, what is the administration's opinion on giving out mine-resistant ambush protection 20-ton vehicles to towns across America? Are you for it or against it? Obviously, we do it, Senator. We're going to look at that. I will also give you anecdotes for mine-resistant ambush protected vehicles of protected police forces in shootouts. But we've already been told they're only supposed to be used for terrorism, right? Isn't that what the rule is? Our rule is for counter-drug, which could have been the shootout. I'd have to look at the incident. Counter-narcotics, counter-terrorism. I guess the point I wish to make is that these are fairly simple problems and common sense applied years ago. We could have fixed these. We're going to maybe fix them, although I have my doubts because I've seen rarely anything ever fixed in government. I find these decisions to be very easy to make. You just shouldn't be giving out mine-resistant vehicles. Bayonets, there's no excuse. I don't understand why we have to get together and have a study for months to decide bayonets are inappropriate to be giving out. I can't imagine any use for a bayonet in an urban setting. The militarization of police is something that has gotten so far out of control, and we've allowed it to descend along with not a great protection of our civil liberties as well. We say we're going to do this. It's okay if it's for drugs. Well, look at the instances of what have happened in recent times. The instance in Georgia just a couple of months ago of an infant in a crib getting a percussion grenade thrown in through a window in a no-knock raid. Turns out the infant obviously wasn't involved in the drug trade, but neither was even the infant's family. Happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. No one's even been indicted on this. So really, this is crazy out of control. And giving military equipment and with the breakdown of the whole idea of due process, of no-knock raids and not having judges issue warrants anymore, you can see how this gets out of control and people are very concerned with what is going on here. And I see the response so far to be lackluster, and I hope you will do a, a more complete job in trying to fix this. Thank you. Who are you? I know who I am. I know what I stand for. And this country is in jeopardy under Muslim Brotherhood, under an administration that's leaking information to the enemy, under communism, 
Right now, I want to get behind somebody. But the thing is, there's nobody there saying it loud, talking about the Constitution, talking about America, and the abuses and usurpations that are going on around the world. I want to get behind a leader who wants to lead. I know what I'm fighting against right now. I don't know who I'm fighting for. Look at the Middle East. It's over 30-some countries who are protesting violently against us. They're saying death to America. There's Occupy groups over there. If you see the consulate in Benghazi on the wall, you see ACAB. That's American Occupy groups from here over there. In that compound, you'll see it on the wall with that ripped American flag. You see the French anarchist mask. There's a lot of people out there who don't want the American ethos to survive, to live. Our government does not believe in you. They do not believe in the American people and we are the only thing left that is standing for what America was born upon. Rugged individualism, American exceptionalism. Where are our allies? Do we have any? Where's England? Where's Europe? You don't see media. They don't stand for us. I'm one of the veterans who stood for OPSEC, who came out against the administration and the leaks. And all of the information that has been coming out even before the Osama bin Laden raid, are they using us for a political ploy? Yes. 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 I say fine. Is it not within the realm of possibility that they could be wanting to give it away for more devious reasons? The president has said himself, judge me by the people I surround myself with. And it just so happens that the people in this administration and the people in the White House are leaking things that are going to get us out there on the field of war, or if they get past them, it comes to you, whether you are Republican, Democrat, Independent, we die. We have to look at these people, the Muslim Brotherhood in our country and in all these countries overseas. We see it as individual conflicts and individual events. You are wrong. Vietnam, World War II, Korea, Iraq, Afghanistan, we look at them as little individual conflicts. Wrong. When these guys come at us, it is something that comes from somewhere in the 600s, 7th century. They see this as one action, world domination, and it is only those people who are to be in charge, and you do not exist in their future plans. With coming out, they have excoriated me. They have pulled all of our addresses, our phone numbers, email addresses, family members, pictures, dossiers on what we do, how we do it, and when we do it. The people I know, my friends, who have nothing to do with us speaking out, their stuff as well, and a lot of you here, your addresses, your information, your stuff as well is out there. The people who stick to their guns, stick to their Bibles, and have antipathy towards outsiders, that's not an insult, that's a compliment to me. But you know what? You earn my trust, you earn my respect, and damn it, you better fight for it. We are coming to a time in this country, people, where, I don't know if you're into physics, but it's called a singularity. It's something that nobody understands, can see, and you call it it. What is it? Something's coming. Everyone feels something in your chest. Do you feel rage? Do you feel uncomfortable? That's it. Your lifestyle, your way of life, your being is on the edge. Whether it be economy, whether it be world war, whether it be civil war, whether it be civil unrest. When I was in Iraq, my first time, we had to protect the provisional government in Iraq while they were writing a constitution and they were going through their first elections in over 64 years. The deputy prime minister looked at me one day and he goes, why are you here? Why are you risking your life so I can write anything down here that we want, that we believe in, without you telling me what to write? And then he says, what is it to be an American? That just stopped me cold, but it wasn't the answer. It was the question that changed my life. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah!